Hello, and welcome to Lecture 2, covering Chapter 2 from Astronomy Today. We are going to talk about the history of astronomy with the title of the Copernican Revolution, because it's a key turning point in the history of astronomy. However, we'll both start a little bit before the Co Copernican Revolution, and we'll continue after it a bit, although we're not be, we'll not be discussing in very much depth modern astronomy. We're basically covering the 1400s up through the 1600s and those key turning points in astronomy. Okay, all right, so the topics of chapter two are ancient astronomy, the geocentric universe, that's when a period of time where the Earth was thought to be the center of the universe, the known universe, then the heliocentric model of the solar system, all right, heliocentric means sun-centered as opposed to geocentric, meaning Earth-centered. Then we'll talk about the foundations of the Copernican Revolution, the title of the chapter, then the birth of modern astronomy, right? Some key, some key discoveries and laws that led to what we call modern astronomy. Then the laws of planetary motions that are also called Kepler's laws, all right? And then we'll talk about some properties of planetary orbits, specifically about ellipses, okay? So as I said above, these are Kepler's laws. All right, then the dimensions of the solar system, which is a little bit of a foray into modern physics techniques, but it comes so directly from these early discoveries about the planets and their distance from us and the fact that we can learn about their orbits. And now with modern techniques, we can actually bounce radar off of those planets and we know exactly how big the solar system is. All right, then Newton's laws, which follow from Kepler's laws, and they actually justify Kepler's laws. Newtonian mechanics, which follow from Newton's laws. And then finally, how we can combine Kepler's laws and Newton's laws to include mass and talk about the weight of the sun, right? as well as the weight of the planets. Okay, all right, so we'll start way back with ancient civilizations and the acknowledgement that they looked at the skies above them and sought to understand them, were fascinated by them, were moved by them. Many ancient societies built structures that marked astronomical events. Stonehenge is very much a structure ma matching up with astronomical events like solstices and so on. These key moments and the solstice would be the sun rising at a particular location on that longest day or that shortest day of the year. All right. So these, these are such important events, such noticeable things, such a way for early people to interact with that sky that must have dominated them in a world where there would have been no light pollution like there are in modern cities. Another example here on Bighorn Medicine, the Bighorn Medicine Wheel that had lines that matched up with the rising and setting of the sun and other stars. Here we have a temple in Mexico in Caracal that has many windows that are lined with astronomical events. Again, think solstices in particular, particular events, all right? Perhaps the retrograde motion of planets, something we'll talk about in just a minute. And really the things that astronomers could observe were the stars, certainly, and they, that led to the grouping of stars and like, like in the constellations. And it wasn't just the ancient Greeks that had constellations. Basically, every ancient society had their own names for these groupings of stars. It was a natural phenomenon to group them together. It was the obvious way, right, as we spoke about before. But then besides the stars, there were these special objects in the night sky, the sun, the moon, and the visible planets, okay? Now they look kind of like stars, just big bright stars, but those are Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Notice of the planets that we now know to be true planets, unlike Pluto, but the planets we know to be true planets that are left off this list, well, it's Uranus and Neptune. And that's because Uranus and Neptune are not visible to the naked eye. And ancient astronomers did not have telescopes. So they only were able to see these objects in the night sky that were visible to the naked eye, the unaided eye, okay? Now, if, for example, Uranus, which is the, the closer of those final two gas giants, Neptune being significantly further and even fainter, if it had been a little bit closer or larger and had been visible to the naked eye and had had that, that special designation because essentially planets appear like wandering stars because the stars were always in the same position relative to each other, but of course planets are not in the same position relative to each other or the fixed stars. Well, the thing is these quote unquote wandering stars, planets, they're special and they led to the days of the week. So my point being, if Uranus had been brighter, we'd have eight days in the week. I guarantee it, all right? But notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven special objects in the night sky, seven days of the week, okay?
All right, so the sun, the moon, and the stars all have simple movements in the sky, okay? But notice what doesn't have simple movements, the planets. So the planets move with respect to the fixed stars, okay? So does the sun and the moon, all right? But they do it at much, a much more gradual basis, not every day. And they change in brightness, which the sun and the moon do a bit, okay? I should say the moon primarily, but the sun, but that would have been, it, it certainly does. We do get closer and further to the sun. That does affect the actual amount of radiant energy that reaches us, but it wouldn't be easily measurable to ancient peoples. The moon does get noticeably larger and smaller, right? So that, that would have been easily measured and noted by ancient peoples. But really much more, much more so, more dramatic changes are the planets. They become very dim. There's times of the, the times of the year they're just not visible at all. All right, they change in their speed. Their speed would be how much distance they cover in a given night. And here's the weirdest thing. They undergo retrograde motion, all right? Now, I remember the first time when I was an astronomy student, I heard this term and I, I thought, what the heck is retrograde? It just means moving backwards, all right? So all of the planets go through a phase where they undergo retrograde motion. They appear to move backwards in the night sky. And I'm not talking about over the duration of a single night. Over a single night, they still rise in the east and they set in the west. But over consecutive nights, they drift in a certain direction, always drifting, actually, in the same direction they rise and set in the given night, drifting towards the west except for a few weeks out of the year where they start drifting backwards, back towards the Eastern horizon. And that's what we call retrograde motion. Here's an example of the retrograde motion of uh, Mars, all right? Looking at December 1st, right? When it stops drifting towards the East on any given night. And then, I mean, I guess it still is up until January 1st, but it's beginning its retrograde, its retrograde loop because by February 1st, look, it's going backwards. By March 1st, it's still going backwards. And only when we get to April 1st does it continue its otherwise year-long march towards the east. So there's this weird little behavior for a small part of the year where planets appear to go backwards. Now, different planets do this more frequently than others and so on. And this was very perplexing to ancient astronomers. What did it mean? All right, well, hold that thought. All right, what is what what did retrograde motion mean? How, how to understand it, okay? Well, we can group planets into inferior planets and superior planets. The inferior planets are Mercury and Venus, and the superior planets are Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. That's because Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are just better than Mercury and Venus. That's actually not why. They're known this way because the inferior planets are closer to the sun than Earth, and the superior planets are further away, okay? Now, this idea of inferior and superior planets is very much based on the modern heliocentric, that's sun-centered, but it actually was also incorporated, oddly enough, in the geocentric universe, because it was thought that the inferior planets, just Mercury and Venus, were closer to us than the sun, then there was the sun orbiting Earth, remember that was the weird incorrect model they had, and then beyond that were the superior planets, okay? But the name kind of still fits now that we know that it's just that Mercury and Venus are closer to the sun that we all orbit, okay? All right. Okay, so the point being that inferior planets are closer to the sun, not closer to us, and superior planets are further away from the sun. Okay, all right. And here we have a correct modern view with a heliocentric model with the sun at the center. And we can see the inferior and superior terms showing up, orbits, an example orbit, all right? And some other terms I wanna mention quickly, that being conjunction and um, opposition, okay? So we can see here, well, excuse me there, that an inferior conjunction occurs when a planet is between us and the sun, right? That would be like Venus be being between us and the sun. Sometimes that can lead to an eclipsing Venus or an eclipsing Mercury that happened recently, quite, quite fascinating. A little black dot traveling across the sun that you can see with the right telescope. Again, ancient peoples would not have been able to do that, okay? Can't stare at the sun with the naked eye. Then there's a sup superior conjunction. All right. Now, that's interesting because it's not a superior orbit. This is a planet that has an inferior orbit, but it's having a superior conjunction because it's it's on the other side of the sun from Earth. OK, so it's kind of a throwback to the geocentric terms. But then we have a superior orbit and we have a conjunction. OK, with no with no prefix to it, it's neither superior nor 
nor um, nor inferior, because superior orbits can only have two things. They can have conjunctions when the planet is on the other side of the sun from us, probably invisible, right? Because you would be obscured by the sun, not necessarily depending on the tilt of the orbits. And then a totally unique term to superior orbits, opposition. And this would be like Mars. So if Mars is in opposition, it's further from the sun from us, but lined up with us in the sun. Okay, so some interesting terms regarding orbits. Now, early observations with the geocentric universe led inferior planets to never be very far from the sun. So they appeared to be kind of tied to the sun somehow, right? Again, ancient astronomers, ancient philosophers, scientists, great thinkers, and they weren't sure why, but they definitely observed that the inferior planets were tied to the sun. In other words, Mercury and Venus are always really close to the sun. That's why they're never visible, visible in the middle of the night. You're never going to see Mercury or Venus at midnight because they're basically following with the sun. Okay, you can see them right at sunset and sunrise if you're lucky at the right days of the year. Now, superior planets, on the other hand, are not tied to the sun at all. All right, and they're going to be up during the night. Okay, potentially, and they undergo noticeable retrograde motion. Okay, now superior planets planets are brightest at opposition. Okay, so that's interesting. There's a big, big difference between their brightness, and that's because when they're at opposition, they're closest to us. So that closeness is very important for brightness, okay? It makes for a very, very bright planet. It also means that it's reflecting all the light of the sun, which helps, because if you consider a planet a conjunction, not only is it far away, but also it is, in, it is in a position where that light that's reflecting has to come back to us more. And actually a better example is inferior conjunction, where the planet is relatively close, but it's in front of the sun. So it's actually not reflecting very much light. It's like a new moon. Remember faces of the moon. And a new moon isn't very visible because you're only really getting a rim of light around the perimeter of that planet. You're not getting reflection off of the actual surface of the planet, okay? All right, and inferior planets are brightest near inferior conjunction, okay? So brightest during that conjunction because they are closest, although there is the noticeable full phase effect. We'll talk about that when we talk about the phases of Venus in just a minute at superior conjunction. Okay. All right. All right. So now continue with the geocentric universe. How did they, and by they being ancient astronomers, explain the retrograde motion? Okay. Now you might be wondering, how do you explain retrograde motion at all? You know, what, what the heck is it? Right? Well, you know, I, I explained it as just, oh, a planet appears to drift backwards, but that wasn't a very good explanation, right? We'll get there. We'll get there in just a moment. We'll talk about where, uh, the actual heliocentric explanation, the correct explanation for retrograde motion. But astronomers didn't have that. They were convinced that the Earth was the center of the known universe, which for them was the solar system, okay? And in order to explain the apparent retrograde motion of planets, they came up with this idea of these weird circles that are connected to orbits, okay? So that, that was the explanation, okay? They needed lots of complications to explain accurate motion. So notice that all the planets have orbits. So here's Earth at the center. Here's the sun mistakenly showing to be orbiting Earth outside of the orbits of Mercury and Venus. But notice all the planets, not the sun, but all the planets have this secondary loop overlaid on their orbit. That was called an epicircle. All right, and the epicircle, the epicircle was the necessary complication to the model that explained the explained the explained the observations that we need. It was totally necessary. And if the, if you if you made the epicircles just they if they turned just fast enough and they were just the right radius, then things worked out. But that's that's a problem because science must explain observations with the simplest model possible. Is this the simplest model? No, it is not the simplest model because what's the justification? What's the physics justification for all planets having these loops upon loops? What does that? They're not literally giant gears turning on other gears, so what is it? Well, these philosophers weren't sure. Maybe they actually were giant gears, okay? So it was the best they were working with, but they were breaking a golden rule in quantitative thinking called Occam's razor, which says that the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one. And this is not the simplest explanation. Absolutely not. Okay. 
So this then is going to take us to the more modern, the definitively modern, in fact, heliocentric model of the solar system that puts the sun at the center of the solar system. The only thing that orbits the Earth is the moon, okay? Because planets can have moons, all right? So that's, you know, because that, that would have been a big hang-up for astronomers because they're like, well, that, I mean, the moon clearly orbits us. There's no other explanation. So everything else must or orbit us too, okay? And also the heavens were thought to be perfect, totally separate from the rules now we know is the physical laws that defined Earth. Furthermore, for Earth to orbit the sun and the distance to the sun being based on, you know, some, some reasonable expectations, that means that Earth would, ha would have to be moving incredibly fast, flying through space at kilometers per second. And rightfully so, ancient thinkers were very skeptical of that idea. They thought, wouldn't we notice if the ground we were standing on was flying through space at high speed? Huh. You might actually wonder that yourself. Why don't we notice that we're moving through space at, at over 10 kilometers per second? Incredibly fast speeds. Why don't we just fly off? Well, we'll get to that when we talk about Newton's laws. Because it turned out after a few generations of great thinkers, these ideas started to coalesce and come together. Okay? That, it's like that, that expression, standing on the shoulders of giants. And that's what people like Newton did a few hundred years later from the point of history that we're just about to start talking about. Okay. Now, I did promise that I'd explain the actual explanation for a retrograde motion. And what it is, is simply one planet passing another in our respective orbits around the sun. Case in point, the, here we have the retrograde motion of Mars. Because look at this, Earth has a smaller orbit than Mars. That actually turns out to mean that Earth is moving faster. Smaller orbit means faster. Okay. We'll talk a bit about why that is. All right. Now, Mars has a larger orbit which means it's moving slower. That means that once a year, Earth will catch up with Mars and pass it. When Earth catches up with Mars and passes it, then Mars appears to drift backwards for the few weeks that we are passing Mars. And that can be illustrated with these lines representing the line of sight from Earth to Mars and the apparent location of Mars on the background of fixed stars because that's all apparent retrograde motion is. Mars appears to appear appears to be located at different points relative to the fixed constellations like the Big Dipper and Andromeda and Cassiopeia and, and all these, these constellations in the sky. Okay, that's it. It appears to drift backwards because the line of sight to Mars on the background as we pass it. Okay, all right. All right, so, so that's kind of the summary of where we're at with the Copernican Revolution. The Copernican revolution being this realization that the Earth orbited the sun, not the other way around, stated the following. Number one, the Earth is not the center of everything. It is the center of something. It is the center of the moon's orbit around Earth. All planets, including Earth, revolve around the sun. Okay, Planets can have moons, like our, like our moon. The stars are very much further away than the sun. Okay, That's important because otherwise, there should be some parallax. And it's true that in Greek times, there were a lot of philosophers, including Aristotle, that did think that the sun was the center of the solar system, but he couldn't explain why there was no parallax of the stars, because no one considered that the stars were so much further away, so much unbelievably further away, that they, yeah, they display parallax, but it's tiny on the order of an arc second, a one three thousand six hundredth of a degree, a degree being horizon to horizon covering 180, all right? So a tiny, tiny variation because the stars are so far away, okay? So the apparent, apparent movement of the stars around Earth is due to Earth's rotation, okay? All right, so the different constellations being, you know, visible at, at peak times of the night during different times of the year. The apparent movement of the sun around the Earth is due to Earth's rotation, all right? And the retrograde motion of the planets is due to Earth's motion around the sun. Okay? Excellent. All right. So, the Copernican Revolution began with Copernicus' publication, published in the last year of his life, which was in 1543. So, we can really think of modern astronomy beginning in 1543 with the publication of Copernicus's work. Oh, excuse me. Okay. So 1543, modern astronomy begins. Now, shortly after that, 
Galileo was born in 1564. Now, Galileo lives from 1564 to 1642. During his life, his 77 years of life, he revolutionized astronomy. But he wouldn't have been in a place to do that had Copernicus not come first and had his heliocentric model accepted. But we see, you know, it took till the last year of his life for Copernicus model to be accepted. But once it was, once Copernicus's model was accepted, then we're really at a point where in Europe at this time, modern astronomy could proceed. Now, there was some pushback, okay? You've probably heard about Galileo being excommunicated. And if you haven't, well, Galileo was excommunicated from the Catholic Church because of his ideas revolving around astronomy, okay? But point being, we've got the birth of modern astronomy. Now, was the heliocentric model accepted right away? No, but a few things that Galileo did to help with this acceptance was to show that space or the solar system was more like Earth than we thought. The heavens weren't perfect. They weren't con constructed of magical gears that turned on other gears. You know, the not so simple explanation that we had for the geocentric model. So what were those observations that Galileo made? They were the following. The moon has mountains and valleys, okay? The sun has sunspots, imperfections. Jupiter has its own moons. Now that, that's a big deal, right? We're, that, that, that makes our moon seem like, oh, okay, so it's part of a process. Okay, planets get moons, all right? You know, that, that helps to build a, a more complete model and understanding of space, the rules of space. Venus has phases. Okay, we're gonna talk about that in just a moment, all right? This picture here shows the Galilean moons, all right? Those being Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those are four giant moons around, around uh, Jupiter. It has these particularly large moons that are easy to see with a basic telescope because what made this all possible was that Galileo was working with the telescope. He didn't invent the telescope, but he made his own based on sketches of other um, engineers that were building telescopes at this time. And he used it, just a basic, you know, piece of basic, you know, just, just glass lenses to be able to see a little bit better. And that all it took, all right? Because these are, these are observations you can make with the, the most, you know, hobby telescope you can imagine. You can do it with simple binoculars. You can find the Galilean moons. You can see sunspots, okay? But you better have something to deal with the extra light from the sun, otherwise you burn, burn your retina. But you can see the phases of Venus, okay? Now, the phases of Venus are a good example because they only make sense with the heliocentric model. So some of these ideas, moons of Jupiter, fate, um, you know, sunspots, they're, they're not directly supporting the heliocentric model. They're just saying, well, you know, sp space is more like Earth than we thought. So, you know, maybe, maybe Earth isn't so special, right? And, you know, or the heavens aren't so different from Earth. But the idea of the faces of Venus are direct evidence, direct evidence for the heliocentric model, right? And direct evidence is great. It's what science is built on. Because in the heliocentric model, Venus goes through a full set of phases. There's a new Venus when Venus is between us and the sun, and there's a full Venus when Earth is on the far side, okay? Superior conjuncture, inferior conjuncture, all right? Okay, remember those terms. And then there's phases in between, like a waxing quarter Venus and a waning quarter Venus, all the same phases the moon has. Now, that those are the actual observable uh, phases of Venus that uh, Galileo saw. If he had instead seen a set of phases that went from new to crescent back to new, well, then he would have inadvertently supported the, the geocentric model because these are the phases that were predicted by the geocentric model, the Earth being the center of the solar system. Well, that's not the case, okay? Earth is not the center of the solar system, and these are not the phases that, that Galileo observed. Okay, nail in the coffin, right? Now, you know, like throwing, throwing that whole idea out that the Earth is the center of the solar system. Now, a term I haven't used much is that that model of the epicircles and Earth being the center of the solar system, that model, that, that incorrect version of the solar system, but again, based off the kind of the best information they're working with, was called the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic model or Ptolemy's model, all right? Named after a scientist, philosopher from about 2000 years ago named Ptolemy. Okay, moving on. Now we get to Kepler. Now Kepler was essentially a contemporary of Galileo. Kepler lived from 1571 to 1630. 
Now, definitely working independent of Galileo, but what Kepler did was he came up with the laws of planetary motion. Galileo did not do that. Galileo was, was more, than, more of an observationist. He was good at, at ma making these observations and documenting them and then publishing them. So that's important too. But Kepler, Kepler was arguably a much greater thinker. He was able to work out the math in a more detailed way. Okay. And Kepler's laws were derived from observations made by another observationist named Tycho Brahe. And Tycho Brahe comes up a lot. He's basically because Kepler worked for Tycho Brahe. He was originally assistant to Tycho Brahe. Tycho Brahe is depicted here. Okay. He's by all, all accounts was a very wealthy, very um, idiosyncratic, very eccentric person that spent a huge amount of time observing stars and having detailed, detailed observations. Interestingly, he did not use a telescope. He did it all with naked eye, even though telescopes were obviously available at this time. But Kepler worked for him. All right. He didn't, the Kepler did not come from money, but he had a very great mathematical mind and eventually was able to take Tycho Brahe's data and really make it shine. Okay. All right. And the laws of planetary motion that Kepler came up with were the following. First of all, all the orbits were ellipses, okay? They weren't perfect circles. And now Coper Copernicus had not suspected this. Copernicus really thought that the earth was not the center, of the, center of, the, of the universe. The sun must be, the sun is more special than earth. Great, okay? But he never suspected that they, that they weren't perfect circles, that they were instead ellipses, okay? That was, that was a unique thought that, was, that came to Kepler based on the data. And Kepler didn't guess this, he just saw it in the data and he couldn't deny it. And thus he accepted that orbits are elliptical. Now, many orbits are very close to circles. So we say they have a very low eccentricity, whereas a orbit that's really stretched out, that is a really stretched out ellipse, that would be a highly eccentric orbit. And interesting, ellipses are always defined by their foci, one focus, two foci, the plural focus. And a great way to think about that, we'll talk about that more in a moment, is you can actually draw an ellipse by taking two pins, sticking them in corkboard, having a string that's held taut, and just tracing out the elliptical path, the stretched out circular path that is naturally drawn by just holding the string tight, as long as it remains attached to the two pins. The two pins represent the two foci, focus and focus, and that actually is how you can naturally create an ellipse. It's a great demonstration of what ellipse is, because if you bring the two pins together and have them overlap on each other, effectively only having one pin, and then you repeat the drawing exercise, what will you have? A circle. So that shows that circles are a special case of an ellipse, just like a square is a special case of a rectangle. Okay? And there are some key terms, major axis and semi-major axis, that again, we'll talk about in just a moment. Okay? But next, and before we get there, Let's talk about the second planetary law, which is the following. Imaginary line connecting the sun and planets sweeps out equal areas in equal times. So in other words, this area A that is swept out in a certain amount of time T must be equal to this area C that's swept out in the same time T. Okay? That's the law. Now, perhaps a simpler way of saying it is that planets move slower when they're further away from the sun and they move faster when they're closer, okay? That's true of Earth. There's about a three million mile difference between when we're closest and, and furthest away from the sun. And indeed, we move slightly faster when we're closest to the sun, all right? There are more dramatic examples like the highly elliptical orbit of Pluto or comets that have elliptical orbits that only bring them back around the sun every few hundred years. They move very fast when they sweep in past the sun. And when that comet goes out past Neptune's orbit into the deep reaches of the solar system, it moves very slowly. That can also be explained of conservation of energy, by the way. But here, we'll just think about, think about it as Kepler's second law, okay? And Kepler's third law is a very interesting statement. It says that the square of the period of a planet's orbit is proportional to the cube of its semi-major axis. Now, there's a bit to unpack there. What are we talking about? Well, the period is its essentially it's a year, how long it takes to go around the sun. It's its orbital time, okay? So if we're measuring in Earth years, we can see the orbital period of Mercury is about a quarter of an Earth year. The orbital period of Earth is exactly one Earth year, okay? 
Now, the semi-major axis, you can think about it as the radius of the orbit of the planet, okay? Because you think of orbits as being circles, most of the time we do. But they're not perfect circles, they're, yep, ellipses. So that radius is technically not a radius, it's a semi-major axis, okay? It can be approximated as a radius. And that semi-major axis, represented by the letter A, is measured in astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance from the sun to the Earth. And we can see then that it's exactly one for Earth. Venus is closer to the sun, right? And then Mercury is only, you know, 38% as far from the sun as we are. On the other hand, Mars is one and a half times further from the sun as we are. And then, of course, the gas giants are very far out, right? Huge distances. Neptune being unbelievably far, 30 times further from the sun than Earth, okay? But the point being is that this, these values of orbital semi-major axis and orbital period create a particular ratio of p squared over a cubed. In other words, p squared equals a cubed, okay? Now, they don't equal it in units, so we often say that they're proportional to each other because they do have different units and you can't technically set things equal to each other that have different units. This would, period would have units of time, a radius or semi-major axis would have units of kilometers, all right? So definitely different units, but the portion, proportionality is there, okay? And one way to represent that proportionality is to show it as a ratio, as we've done in this table, and to show that that ratio is always equal to one. Now, is it perfectly equal to one? No, but it's pretty close, okay? It's pretty darn close, okay? That's Kepler's third law, that this ratio is always equal to one, all right? Good. Now, one, inch, one thing, if we're talking about elliptical orbits, and I mentioned that really stretched out elliptical orbits have high eccentricity, and elliptical orbits that are very close to circles have low eccentricity. The way we numerically express that is we say that an eccentricity equals zero for a perfect circle. So we can see that these values are quite small because they're pretty darn close to a perfect circle. Venus is really close to a perfect circle, so is Earth. Mercury is actually fairly elliptical, right? Not that elliptical, but fairly elliptical. And we can see that, you know, some, some of these other orbits are, you know, kind of, kind of there, you know, that, but definitely uh, Mercury um, stands out as being one of the, really the most elliptical of all the orbits. Okay. Now the thing about these eccentricity values is they're all fairly small because all the orbit values are fairly circular. If you have an ellipse that is really stretched out like this and has the sun at one, one of the two foci, well, an orbit, an eccentricity of an ellipse that is this type of shape might be something like 0.6 because it's that eccentric, it's that stretched out. Orbits like that are really reserved in our solar system for things like comets, okay? It turns out in other solar systems, there's planets that have orbits like that, but that's a discussion for another day. Okay, now here's a little bit more precise discussion about ellipses, right? Some of the key terms, okay. So the semi-major axis, I promise I'd talk about it more, and eccentricity of orbits completely describe the ellipse, okay? So all you need to know is the semi-major axis length and eccentricity. If you know those two values and you know everything about the ellipse, okay? All right, the perihelion is the term when a planet is closest to the sun, and the amphelion is the term when the planet is furthest from the sun. So these are two good, important key terms, okay? So for example, this would be the perihelion of an orbit. This would be the amphelion. If you look at this orbit of this imaginary planet, this is actually highly eccentric, but often that's the way we draw them because we can more, we can more clearly illustrate the idea of eccentricity. Because here we can see that the major axis, okay, here's the major axis right there. The major axis is the distance from one edge of the ellipse to the other, all right? And the semi-major axis is exactly half of the major axis. It's exactly half. We draw a bisector right down the cutting the ellipse in half it, because ellipses are symmetric along this bisector. You could fold it over and fold over exactly. And so that creates the semi-major axis is exactly half of the major axis, okay? And then the distances, the actual distance of perihelion and amphelion will be semi or will be major axis A times one minus E and major axis times one plus E, see, okay? So those, those are the values. And actually, A, A is not major axis. A is semi-major axis. I want to make that clear, 
okay? Because a, a is the semi-major axis. The major axis is equal to 2a, exactly, precisely 2a, okay? So you can see then that those, those relative distances of perihelion and amphelion are determined entirely by what two, what two numbers, what two values? Semi-major axis and eccentricity, okay? So that's, that's our little you know, math side note about ellipses. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to jump forward in time real fast. We'll go back to the, uh, the 1600s in a moment, but we'll jump, we'll jump to it just for a couple slides, talk kind of about, about some modern consequences of understanding that we live in a heliocentric solar system. One of those is the idea of the astronomical unit, which is the mean distance from Earth to the sun, okay? That is the semi-major axis. Semi major major axis, okay? And th that distance, an astronomical unit, astronomical unit, was first measured during the transits of Mercury and Venus, Venus using triangulation, okay? So the triangulation technique that we discussed, it's very similar to parallax, okay? And the, you know, using the scale of the size of the sun, okay? Wonderful. But a more modern way of measuring the, an astronomical unit is using radar. But we can't bounce radar off the sun, but we can bounce it off of other planets like Venus. So if we bounce a radar signal off of um, Venus, transmitting it from Earth, having it reflect off of Venus, then we can measure that distance at 0.3 AU, and then we can use Kepler's third law to measure our own orbital radius. See? Pretty cool. Okay. All right, now back to the 1600s, because Newton is the last historical figure we're going to discuss, really the end of this era of discovery. Newton stood on the shoulders of Copernicus, Galileo, and Kepler. In fact, he came exactly one generation after Galileo and Kepler. He was born the year that Galileo died. He lived from 1643 to 1727, and he was able to then be in the right place at the right time where so many of these ide ideas had been moving around, had been discussed, and they really came together. And Newton certainly had the mind to help bring them together, bringing together ideas of motion, gravity, planetary motion, and using the math to describe it, okay? So Newton's laws of motion explain how objects interact with the world and with each other. Now, Newton has three laws of motion. Newton's first law of motion says an object will, will remain at rest, okay, or an object at rest will remain at rest, and an object moving in a straight line at a constant speed will not change its motion. In other words, it will continue in a straight line at a constant speed unless an external force acts on it. So if you have a completely smooth pond and there's no wind resistance and you push something across that ice on that smooth pond, it'll just continue forever. But of course, in the real world, we always know there are external forces. So there's always things to stop, okay? But otherwise, inertia will carry things on. They'll, they'll keep things moving. Now, this first law is so important because it helps us understand why we don't notice that we're flying through space at over 10 kilometers per second, all right? That's because we are in motion and there's no external force to push us out of that motion. We were essentially continuing at constant velocity around, constant speed at least, constant speed around the sun, okay? And there are internal forces within Earth, like gravity's, like Earth's gravity's pull, pull on us, but there are no external forces from beyond Earth that are affecting us. Thus, we continue to move with Earth at high speed, and we don't notice because of Newton's first law, okay? Now, Newton's second law, known as the law of acceleration, says when a force is exerted on an object, its acceleration, which is its change in speed, is inversely proportional to its mass. So in other words, you have to push harder on large things in order to get them moving. Okay? That's what it tells us. Okay? And Newton's third law is no, known as the law of force pairs, or the equal and opposite law, says that when an object A exerts a force on object B, object B exerts an equal and opposite force on object A. And by opposite, we mean opposite in direction. Okay? And those are Newton's three laws of motion. And they are incredibly helpful. There are so many things that we can describe, so many complicated systems that we can break into little pieces, follow Newton's laws, and understand their behavior, okay?
Now, turns out that Newton didn't stop with these three laws of motion. He also came up with a law of universal gravity. And it goes something like this. On Earth's surface, except the acceleration of gravity is approximately constant and it is directed towards the center of Earth. So we could just take that as a, as a magical fact. Okay, well, there's, there's gravity on Earth and it's this strong. But is gravity like that everywhere? Is there gravity on the moon? Is it just as strong? These are the questions that Newton asked. And his conclusion was that the same force that pulls objects down on Earth must pull the moon down towards us. It's just that the moon is much further away, so the force is much smaller, okay? At least proportionally smaller. And so that was the universal part. The same force that pulls objects down on the surface is the object that keeps the moon orbiting around Earth. And he worked out the numbers and he came up with the following relationship. For two massive objects, gravitational force is proportional to the product of their masses divided by the square of the distance between them. Now, would this apply to mass objects that aren't that massive? You know, would it apply to say you and the Earth? Does that mean that, that if the Earth is pulling on you, you of gravitational force, you're also pulling on the Earth? Yes, but you're so much less massive you're a trillion, one trillion of trillionth of the mass of the Earth, that your pull on the Earth is unmeasurably small. But it's there. You are technically pulling on the Earth. You're pulling Earth towards you just as Earth is pulling you towards it. You're pulling on each other. But again, for something so massive as the Earth and something as small as a person, it seems like it's a one-way force. But when we deal with two massive objects, it's obvious that they're pulling on each other. We see that with the moon. We see that with the pull between Jupiter and the sun. We see it between the pull between two stars in binary star systems where two stars orbit each other. So we definitely see cases of two large objects pulling on each other, all right? In our own solar system, there's dwarf planets like Pluto that have moons that are almost as big as them. And in that case, certainly there's a lot of, there's a lot of pull back and forth between those two massive bodies, okay? And again, the law states that it's proportional to the product of the masses that we see in the numerator and the square of the distance between those two massive objects is, those two massive objects that we see in the denominator. And if you're wondering what that big G is, that big G is the gravitational constant. And this is the fitting constant that Newton came up with to show what the numbers are, you know, what, how, how, how this law actually works. But it's an empirical constant, it's a fitting constant. We don't know where it comes from, it just appears to be the way the universe is tuned. Just like you tune an instrument, we have a tuning constant of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton square, square meters over square kilograms, okay? All right, so here is Newton's law of universal gravitation, and a little bit larger, okay? The constant G called the gravitational constant is measured experimentally, and it's found to be the following, okay? It's one of the three constants of the universe. Gravitational constant, speed of light, and something called Planck's constant. We don't know where they come from, but we know they're there. Is there some, some universal law that connects the three? Maybe, we just haven't discovered it yet. Okay, so more about Newtonian mechanics. These are the consequences of Newton's laws. Well, one of them is that Kepler's laws are themselves a consequence of Newton's laws, okay? Kepler didn't know this, know this when he came up with the laws. Again, Kepler or Newton came a generation after Kepler, okay? Kepler's laws were observation-based. So are Newton's laws, okay? But Newton's laws are actually more fundamental and they explain the ones that were discovered earlier. Pretty neat, right? It's a neat way how science can go back and explain things that we've already kind of accepted, okay? And the first law needs to be modified, okay? That's the law about you know the elliptical orbits because it turns out that the if you think of the Earth orbiting the sun, it's not that the sun is at the focus of the elliptical orbit, it's that there actually is a shared focus that is the, at the center of mass of the two orbits. So technically, any two objects are never, one is never truly orbiting the other, they're all, always orbiting each other. Now, sometimes that center of mass of a two-body system, say Earth and the Sun, is so close to the more massive object that it effectively is at the center of that more massive object, but not quite. All right. So the sun is is about a million times larger in volume than the Earth, but there still is some center of mass of the the balance point. That's what center of mass means. The center of mass between the Earth and the sun that isn't quite at the center of the sun. It's a few thousand kilometers up towards the surface. And in fact, for something as massive as Jupiter, the center of mass between the Earth or between the sun, excuse me, the sun and Jupiter is actually at the surface of the sun. So it's no, it's noticeably not at the center. 
okay? But it's still basically within the sun. So, you know, it's, it's a subtle effect, but it can be very important, okay? And so that's the idea, is that the actual focus of the ellipse is the shared focus, which is the center of mass, okay? The center of mass, the balance point. So see what, what Newton's laws really do, that Kepler's laws don't do, is they include mass, okay? New, Newtonian mechanics are all about including mass in the consideration. Because really, up to this point, you know, astro astronomers, scientists had all these great ideas, but they never figured out how to work with mass, this idea. That was, that was Newton's genius, was he was able to take these ideas and include mass, the importance of mass, inertia, measured in kilograms. What does it really do? Okay, And here we see its effect. It's, it's necessary modification to Kepler's first law. So it turns out Kepler's first law was slightly wrong. Okay, It's true that everything's elliptical, but it's not like there's one ellipse. There's two ellipses ellipses with a shared focus. That's always the case, okay? All right, so furthermore, Newtonian mechanics tells us that the force keeping the planets in orbit around the sun is the gravitational force. Okay, so now we actually have a, a reason why there's orbits, and it's due to the masses of the planet and the sun. It's that gravitational attraction between any two masses. This allows us to calculate the mass of the sun knowing the orbit of Earth. So really, we can think of this formula right here as combining Newton's second law, law of gravitation, and Kepler's third law. Because when you bring all those laws together, you can get this relationship right here. You can find the mass of the sun based on the radius of the Earth, or the semi-major axis, but we can approximate it as a circle and a radius, the velocity of Earth around the sun, and the gravitational constant. Pretty amazing, okay? And a final note is that we can even extend these ideas to things that certainly no one was doing in Newton's time, and that was sending objects out into, out into space, permanently escaping Earth's pole, and really allowing us to not just look through telescopes, but actually travel out into space. Right? And what I am sure was, was the dream of all scientists. And finally, you know, so many hundreds of years later, we started to do it. Because we can calculate the necessary escape speed using a similar calculation to relating the mass of the sun to Earth's orbital velocity. And we can find out how fast an object needs to travel in order to escape Earth's gravitational pull. And then we can even extend that idea to the escape speed from the sun itself. How fast does a space probe need to be traveling to escape the gravitational pull of the sun and permanently leave not just Earth, but the entire solar system? Well, these are the things that we work with today. Okay, so in summary, we have the first models of the solar system were geocentric, but they couldn't easily explain retrograde motion. They had to have very complicated models that didn't follow the scientific principles. The heliocentric model does it also explains brightness variations. Copernicus is, was the key person behind this heliocentric revolution. Then we had Galileo and Galileo's observations that supported the heliocentric model and just a more detailed understanding of what space was and its similarity to the Earth. Then we had Kepler's laws that gave us these empirical, empirical means based on observation, that told us about planetary motion from observations. Finally, three generations after Copernicus. The laws of Newtonian mechanics explained all these things, brought it all together, Kepler's observations included mass, and finally gravitational force between two masses is proportional to the product of the masses divided, the, divided by the square of the distance between them. And believe you me that this is gonna come back, that we're gonna use this to understand a lot of things because we're gonna talk in more detail about said those Galilean moons. We're going to talk in more detail about distant objects like comets and Kuiper belt objects, and we will need this statement as we move forward. All right, so I hope this rather, rather large and, and heavy chapter has been a good foundation, and you feel that you can use it as we move forward to talk about very interesting things in our solar system. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it has been interesting.